वसुदेवसुत कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गुरु so we are doing the ninth chapter of the bhagavad gita and uh, in the ninth chapter we were on the 17th verse is that right those are following yes let me start with the 17th verse those who can you please follow me you can repeat after me pitaham asya jagato पिताहम से जगत माता धाता पिताम माता धाता पिताम वेद्यम पवित्रमोकार वेद्यम पवित्रमोकार ऋक्साम यजुरे वच ऋक्साम यजुरे वच and the father of this world the mother the dispenser the grandsir that which is to be known the purifier the om and also the vedas rik saman and yajus all right so what's going on see in vedanta what we do is we first center ourselves in our real self in who or what we are how do we do that in this experience right now this lived experience which we are having in this we make a clear difference between the object and the subject so who am i whatever i experience is an object and i am the experiencer why are you making a rule about it no i'm not making a rule about it it's how you how we experience ourselves and right now isn't it that we say i am the experiencer i am the knower i am the enjoyer i am the sufferer and i see and i experience know enjoy or suffer these 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 things that's how we live our life so we are always the experiencer so i am the experiencer but what is the nature of the experiencer how do we understand the experiencer as it really is the rule is whatever you experience is an object it's not the experiencer and you are the experiencer itself how do we apply this in sanskrit there's a word idam this whatever we can designate as this this place this person come even closer this body this it's not me because i am the experiencer of this not theoretically Um, in the lived experience uh, what might be called in philosophy phenomenologically as you experience it right now this body and go even deeper this breath it's this it's an object go even deeper this emotion this feeling it's an object not me this idea even this kind of thinking philosophical thinking which i am doing this it's an object not me eliminate all the this all the object practically not so easy but at least in understanding you will be left with a blank drop that blank also that's also this blank this nothingness the uh, then so will we find ourselves the pure consciousness absolutely not you'll never find it and thank god if you found it it would be a this idam yeah it would be something that appears to you so you are the never object ever subject never to the seen ever the seer that that awareness to which everything appears there is a value to the buddhist analysis you know when they say the self there is no such thing as a self it's good it's a good way of purging our mind of everything that you know, it's clinging to as the self And the buddhist will say you are a vedantist looking for the atman you'll never find it because there's no such thing as the atman and they are right you might say what do you mean they are right you have been telling us all along that uh, there is atman it's consciousness it's brahman they are right there is no such thing as the atman absolutely if you look for the atman 
You will never see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, touch it. See, I can think about it. Whatever you're thinking about is not the Atman. And speak about it. You just said Atman. If you spoke about it, either if it designates something, the word designates something, it means something, then you have, it's not the Atman. So, we can, it cannot conceive about it. You cannot speak about it. You cannot sense it in any way. So then it's nothing? Nothing at all? No, not even that. You will end up with a blankness, with like a space-like emptiness. And yet, and I'm using the Buddhist language, that space-like emptiness is also luminous. It's like the vast blue sky. It's empty space and yet it's blue and radiant. It's that luminosity to which everything else appears. But it's not that luminous. Don't start looking for a luminosity now. Yeah. It will never happen because it's you are that luminosity. You are that vastness, that luminosity. That's just the first, the opening theme in Vedanta. The next is that I, this limitless awareness, this spacious luminosity, that's who I am, that's who I really am. And in it appears everything else. The mind, the senses, the body and the external universe, all of it appears there in that luminosity. And is not, does not constitute a second reality apart from you, the luminosity. I'll repeat that. The entire display of this universe does not constitute a second reality apart from this spacious luminosity which you are. This is the meaning of Atman is Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi. Another way of putting the same thing. All that we do in Advaita Vedanta is we seek to ascertain what we are ending up as this witness consciousness, this awareness, pure subject awareness. Then we establish the limitlessness of that awareness. What do I mean by limitlessness? There is nothing in this universe which constitutes a limit, an end to that awareness. What I mean by that is when we begin, we are distinguishing the awareness from objects. So this object constitutes an end, a limit to, to me, the awareness. Where does I, the awareness, stop? Here. This is an end to me. This is beginning of something else. Now we are saying, no, no, no. Not beginning of something else. This is also nothing other than that I, the awareness. So now when we come to say that I, the awareness, and am appearing as my own idam. Idam means this. I am appearing as my own this. Uh, drashta, the seer, is also appearing as the drishya, the scene. Kshetra, the field, the kshetragya, the knower of the field, is also the, the field itself, kshetra. That will come in the 13th chapter later on. And thus alone the knower of the field is limitless. Thus alone the witness consciousness is limitless. Do you understand the importance of limitlessness? Because the moment, if there's a limit, limit means end. End means where I come to an end and something else begins. Because if you stop simply at I am an awareness which is watching, it might be just like I am an awareness and where do I, this I, the awareness, come to an end? First, I will run up against something called the mind, thoughts, feelings, emotions. Then I run up against something called the body after that. And then the external universe. But now I'm saying all of that is pervaded by me, the awareness. I am not separate from the universe. The universe is an appearance in me. Just as this whole physical universe appears in the sky itself. Just as the dream universe appears in the dreaming mind. Similarly. Be careful, I'm not, Advaita does not say the universe is appearing in the mind. No, mind and object are both appearing in consciousness. So, is consciousness like a bowl in which mind and object are kept? Uh, the mind, body, universe, everything is kept in a bowl and the bowl is consciousness. Is it like that? Is it contained actually? No. There are no contents. It's true and through one reality only. Only consciousness, only being, only bliss, Satchidananda. Because if there are contents, you could count them. Here is the bowl. Here is a piece of chalk. Here is a flower. Here is a fruit. These are the contents in the bowl. No. And say, where are you getting all this? Mm -hmm. we, we did it in the ninth chapter. Uh, 
In the ninth chapter, there were three amazing verses. At the, almost at the very beginning. He says that in the fourth verse, Maya tatamidam sarvam jagat abhyakta murtina. I pervade this entire universe in my unmanifested form. As what? As consciousness. Why unmanifested? Because it's not a this. It's not manifested as this. So everywhere you see the this, I am pervading it all as consciousness. I am, those are not separate from me. Then second step, if you remember, three amazing lines here. The second step was, Matsthani sarva bhutani. Nachaham teshu avasthita. I am pervading them in what sense? It's like here is a room, it's pervaded by light. You switch on the light, light fills up the room. Or you li light an uh, incense and the fragrant fills up the room. Is it like that? There is a physical universe and it's pervaded by consciousness? Yeah. That's the present panpsychist view. If you ask David Chalmers and others, panpsychism is that, um, yeah, we recognize consciousness is a fundamental reality of this universe. What's it like? It's ubiquitous. Here is this physical universe, time, space, matter, energy, and it's pervaded by consciousness. Consciousness is also there. Just like matter and energy and space pervades this physical universe, similarly consciousness also pervades this physical universe. Here he says that, no, no, no. It's not like that. Even deeper. It's rather consciousness is... And the universe is in that. He says, Matsthani Sarva Bhutani. In me, the consciousness, the entire universe is. And he says, Nachaham Teshu Avasthita. It's not that I am, there's a universe and I, I am in the universe. No, they are all in me. And then he goes even further, the final state. Fifth verse, Nacha Matsthani Bhutani Pashyame Yoga Maishwaram. All the being, beings are not in me. First he said, I pervade everything. Second he said, that they are all in me. And third he said, they are not in me. Then where are they? They are not. I alone am. What is this I which pervades the entire universe? In fact, there is no universe. I alone am. This is pure consciousness. And the I there is the real you. Is real I. Is a pure consciousness which I am. So this is Advaita Vedanta. Where does God enter into this picture? Bring in the, the ocean metaphor, the ocean waves metaphor. It is true that in the ocean, in the waves, there is only one real. There is just one thing which appears as this ocean, which is water. It's like pure consciousness, one reality. In which all you know, drops of water and foam and surf and waves from the smallest to the biggest tsunami wave. Indeed, the entire ocean appears in water. And there is no, it's not like water is a container in which some waves are kept. No, it's the water alone. However, even after this understanding, even after this understanding, we still are back to the waves and ocean thing. It's still the wave. The wave is still there. It's floating around. It's going up and down. And there is the whole ocean. By which I mean, we experience the universe as individual and collective. Individual and cosmic. Each of us is an individual and here surrounding us is the cosmic. So if the wave is the individual being, jiva, like us, the entire ocean would be God. It's true, all of it is God. And individuals are parts of it, slices of it, like us, arising and disappearing in the total. But beyond the individual, beyond the total is the water itself. You see, water doesn't seem very impressive. The ocean seems very impressive. No, no, no. Water is most impressive. Because the waves are tiny and temporary and they're all part of this massive thing called the ocean. But both wave and ocean depend on water because without water there would be no uh, waves, no ocean. Suppose you take the water away. Then uh, the ocean would disappear completely, immediately. We say likewise, without the ocean, water wouldn't exist. No, it would. It can exist as uh, water in, uh, in uh, as water vapor, as clouds, as the water in the in this glass, uh, in this um, cup in in front of me. It would exist. Um, so, 
God in Vedanta is the totality, is the ocean. The individual is like the wave, arising and disappearing in the ocean. But beyond a wave and ocean is this one mass of pure consciousness, which is both God and you. Or rather, it's neither God nor you, it's this one reality, which, which all of us actually are. And one more little correction here. Because of um, uh, example, limi- examples are always limited. Because someone might just think, okay, but you know, if we are really water and I'm a wave, a wave has a little bit of water. The ocean has lots of water. So if I'm water, I'm just a little bit of water. So I'm a little bit of Brahman. And the ocean is a whole lot of Brahman. And that other wave has more Brahman than me. (laughs) No, there is no whole or part in uh, Advaita Vedanta, uh, monistic Vedanta or non-dual Vedanta. You are all of it. In fact, actually the category of all and part doesn't apply there. You are the, the reality, limitless reality, which is not measurable. When you say whole or part, there's a whole different system of Vedanta called Vishishta Advaita Vedanta which talks of the whole and the part. All right. Now we are talking about the ocean. So Krishna here is talking about the ocean. 17th verse. Ocean is all sentient beings and um, and the entire physical uh, insentient universe also. Whose phone is that, do you think? It must be in somebody's pocket who's kept it. Somebody... (laughs) <laughs> All right. It's here in this room, is it? Yes. It's, oh, it's in the room. Oh, it's there? In the coat? Oh, somebody got it. Okay, it's done. <laughs> so, here Krishna says, Pitaham Masya Jagato Mata Dhata Pitamaha I am the father of this universe. So, in Judaism, especially in Judaism and Christianity, but also in Hinduism, theistic Hinduism, God is the father is the father in what sense philosophically the cause of this universe Mm. cause of this universe that from which the universe has come who made everything god made everything how from what he says mata i'm the mother of this universe so if father is there who is uh, mrs god (laughs) well god says i am mr god and mrs god too in uh, philosophical terms, what does that mean? In Vedanta we say, Abhinna nimitto padana karana. I am the one undifferi- in, uh, undifferentiated, intelligent and material cause of this universe. A simple example will make it clear. When things are made, things are made of something. So a carpenter makes a table out of wood. Uh, or a potter makes a pot out of clay. The potter is different and the pot is different. The, the clay is transformed into the pot by the intelligent creator, the potter. Now, how is this universe, how does God make this universe? What did God make this universe out of? Swami Vivekananda used to make fun of the uh, potter and, uh, um, you know, a separate potter and a separate clay which God makes, you know, sort of fashions into the universe. There is, a, there is actually an Indian philosophy which says that. The Nyaya philosophers, Nyaya Vaisheshika philosophers, they say there have been eternal free-floating atoms. And God is this uh, intelligent being because of whose will these atoms come together into the universe. So they form planets and stars and everything. Pretty advanced for something so ancient in principle. But Vedanta does not agree with that. It does not say that there is a separate intelligent creator and a separate material out of which was created. Rather, Vedanta uses the example of the spider. So the spider, uh, it um, uh, projects a web out of its own body. So the web is the creation, is the effect, and the spider is the cause. But what kind of a cause? Is it like a potter or is it like the clay? Or both? Both. Both. It's It's the one... Intelligent and material cause of the universe. What's the intelligent cause in case of a pot? Potter. What's the material cause in case of a pot? Clay. But for the web of the spider, what's the intelligent cause? The spider. The creature, the sentient being called the spider is the one which weaves the web. And what's the material cause? The spider's body, own body. 
exactly like that advaita vedanta says uh, it is um, pure consciousness existence consciousness bliss which is the uh, intelligent cause of this universe and um, like the body of the spider what is the body of this being it's maya maya made of sattva rajas tamas the three three qualities sattva rajas tamas out of which out of itself this being spins this universe what is this be- being it's god it's in vedanta saguna brahman or ishvara it's the ocean if the ocean were intelligent then you could say that the, the example would ap- apply to that because the waves and the foam and the bubbles they all come out of the ocean play around in the ocean and disappear back into the ocean so the definition of god or brahman saguna brahman ishvara god in vedanta is um janmadhyasya yata in the brahma sutra that from which the universe is born in which the universe exists into which it finally disappears ocean that from which the waves are born in which the waves exist into which the waves finally merge so all beings are born from god exist in god and disappear back into god god means saguna brahman or ishvara mundaka upanishad says yathornanabhi srijate grinhate cha as the spider spins the web and absorbs it pulls it back again retracts it yatha oshadhaya sambhavanti yatha yatha prithibhyam oshadhaya sambhavanti as from the earth herbs and plants emerge yatha purushat satah keshalomani tatha aksharat sambhavati ha vishvam as from the living human body comes out this non living nails and uh, hair huh? similarly from this pure being pure sentience comes this apparently objective universe emerges so these are just examples the philosophical systematizing comes afterwards exactly in the same way tathaksharat mm-hmm. sambhavati ha vishwam this vishwam this universe it emerges appears from the uh, akshara the imperishable reality this perishable universe appears from the imperishable reality this objective universe appears from the reality which is pure consciousness this universe which is a mixture of pleasure and pain and sorrow and ever changing appears from that which is pure bliss satchidananda appears as this universe so he says i am the father and the mother pitaham asya jagat of this world of this universe i am the father and the mother not only that he says pitaham i am the grandfather also <laughs> so there is a saying god has no grandchildren that means we are all the children of god this is another way of saying the same thing if the father and the grandfather are one and the same so there is nobody who is the grand grandchild of god all are children of god but the meaning here is god is without a cause if you say god the uh, god is the cause of this universe in the producer of this universe the sustainer of this universe and finally the dissolver of this universe creator sustainer destroyer of this universe then what is the cause of god it's like every little kid has asked this question who made everything god so mom who made god the usual answer is keep quiet <laughs> yeah. and here god gives us the answer nobody made god because the cause of god who is the cause of the father the grandfather but here the grandfather and father are one and the same there's no cause of god it's the causeless cause if you if you call it that way all right what is causality what is causality then cause and effect he says i am causality dhata the dispenser karma and its results are all given the results of karma are given me by me i am the master of this law of karma which we'll see more of that in the next verse what is going on here let me just make a point i've already mentioned this earlier i think um, in the last class of the class before that in this chapter and more more so in the 10th and the 11th chapters what krishna is going to say is he is going to divinize the world till now what was the world maya maya 
Mm. I'm, I think I quoted a monk, a traditional monk in Banaras who told me this. In Gita, what is uh, the world? Jagat, what is the world? Heya Divya Brahma Swarup. Heya Divya Brahma. Heya means something fit to be discarded, given up. Why is this world fit to be discarded and given up? This is very shocking, especially here in Manhattan. No, we are here. The whole city stands on the presumption that we are here to enjoy this world. But not the whole city. There are places like the Vedanta Society also. <laughs> That's what makes New York so great. You know, you have got everything here. Why? Because anityam, it's impermanent. This world is continuous change. Anityam. So, dukkham. I'm not going to it. This was the Buddha's great equation. The great insight. Sarvam dukkham. All is suffering. Why is all suffering? Even if we were to accept it. But why? Because he says anitya. Impermanent, impermanent. Indeed everything is impermanent. Not just impermanent. No, we say let it be impermanent. If it lasts enough for me to enjoy it. A cookie lasts one, uh, two seconds. That's enough for me to enjoy it. A movie lasts two hours. That's enough. Who wants an eternal movie? We are trapped in an eternal movie though. <laughs> Who wants an eternal movie? Uh, uh, it's, um, and a life. A life lasts 80 or 90 years. That's great. You really wouldn't want to live uh, thousands and thousands of years. And you know, when people say, eternal um, immortality, eternal life, but when you really think about it, doesn't sound such an, like such an attractive proposition. It's because they're thinking of themselves as this limited e um, being existing uh, eternally. You know, as this, this person. And uh, I'm already bored of life at the age of 90 or 100. And if I'm going to exist for a thousand years, 10,000 years, it'll be terrible. <laughs> but not in that sense. You don't exist in that sense. You exist as an impersonal reality. So, transitory, transitory, impermanent, Im impermanent. But then the Buddha says, not just impermanent. Kshanikam, uh, kshanikam. Momentary, momentary. It's not that it lasts for, it's an illusion. If you think it lasts for two seconds or 20 years or 80 years. No, it's changing moment to moment. It's disappearing moment to moment. And not only disappearing moment to moment. Empty, empty, all is empty. So, anityam, anityam, sarvam, anityam, kshanikam, kshanikam, sarvam, kshanikam, shunyam, shunyam, sarvam, shunyam. Transitory, transitory, all is transitory, momentary, momentary, all is momentary, empty, empty, all is empty. And therefore, so, dukkham, dukkham, sarvam, dukkham. Hence, there is suffering, there is suffering. You try your best. Make things the way exactly, if you ever are lucky enough, fortunate enough to arrange the world, your own health and people around you, your own mind to exactly the state you want it to be so that you can be really happy. What will happen the next moment? It will change. It will change. The next moment it will change. And if you have pushed it to the optimal level, the next change will be less suboptimal. So 99.999% of the time we are going to be dissatisfied. Dukkham, Dukkham, Sarvam, Dukkham. It comes out of impermanence. Therefore, and then the next thing, it is Maya. So why is the world fit to be discarded? Anitya, Dukkha, Maya. And all of this I'm just quoting from that Swamiji from Banaras. Therefore, world is fit to be discarded. And that's what was going on till now. The Vedantic teaching. Next level. Once you have understood this, now take a fresh look at the world. It is God appearing in all these ways. So it is divya, it is divine. Can't we jump directly to the divine part? It's nice. Why do you have to go to this nasty, <laughs> give up the world part, you know, unhappiness, sorrow? You can't. It's divine. You see God in everything. Once you have given up the worldly aspect of it, the divine aspect of it reveals itself. And then finally we'll come to the Advaitic realization. There's no question of a world. It's Brahman, one un undivided uh, uh, existence, consciousness, bliss without a second, a non-dual reality. But before that, a divine reality. Divinity pervades everything. Why I'm saying this is, give up the world, there's a very serious instruction there about spiritual life. 
It's not that you have to become a monk, but monk-like. What it means is, often when we say, you have to love God. These, these chapters are about loving God, to love God. What about all the people in the world? If I'm not a monk, I have a father and a mother and a husband and a wife and children and brothers and sisters and friends and community. All of these people, should I not love them? Here is the straight and unpopular answer. But bitter truth, no, no. You love, what Vedanta wants to say is, spirituality wants to say is, you love God in them. But don't love, they are beings, they are sentient beings in Maya just as we are. And one sadhu was asked, I have, somebody asked him the question in Hindi, so I have parents and father, so, um, in Hindi, Pita se prem karta hu, Mata se prem karta I have love for my father, I have love for my mother. And the answer, shocking answer from the sadhu was, Laat khaoge kore parenge. You will get kicks and you will get blows in life. Why? Remember, these are also beings in, in Maya just as we are. Sentient beings, ignorant beings. It's not like loving an enlightened being, like a, a Jivan Mukta, uh, you know, like a saint. That's different. Everybody else is a being in Maya. And if you catch hold of that person, yes, I love God, but I also love this person as this person. What will happen is this person will drag you through Maya, through the troubles and ups and downs through which that person is going, you will also be dragged. He or she will subject himself to the sufferings and you also. The more moment you hook yourself with this person. Everybody knows this, especially parents know it. Then what do you do? Do you hate people? Of course not. Remember, Divya, God is present there. You love God in them. The sentient creature, the person, you deal with them as a well-wisher, as um, morality or ethics would have. Do your duty, love the divinity within them. That divinity is there in everybody and within you also. This is an important thing to understand. Otherwise, the general instruction, you know, you love God, love everybody. Immediately people misunderstand. Oh, so you have to love these people as they are. No, you have to love people as God in them and be the well-wisher for everybody. Do your best for them. Do your duty for them. The more you love the human side of people, the more trouble you are asking for. And it's not just some random monk who says this. Ma Sharada herself, the kindest, gentlest person imaginable. She says, Manush ke bhalo vashle ma dukkho pave. If you, if she, says, she says, love God, my child, to a, to a lady who had come. If you love the human, as a human being, you will suffer. You will suffer. Will it make a difference to people? No. People will like you more and more. You don't have to tell them, I'm going to stop loving you as a person now, but I'm going to love the God in you. Yeah. That will annoy people. But don't do that. Just internally make the change. And people will love you more for it. Our human love is full of expectations. It's full of, it has claws and teeth. But the love of God does not have that. This is why he's saying, I am present in everybody and in everything. That's what he's pointing out. Then next he says, Vedyam pavitra mongkara riksama yajurevacha. Vedyam, I am the one thing to be known. So in the, all the Vedas, Vedas, all the scriptures, all of this mass of spiritual literature, what is it they're trying to point out? They're point, trying to point me out, God. It's one divine reality. So, I am the one thing to be known. So, in the Vedas, for example, uh, there are these two parts. The bulk of it is mass of rituals. Various Vedic gods, mean small g gods, devatas, powers were there. People worship them in order to fulfill their desires. Uh, I want um, good rainfall and good crops and um, let my kingdom or my business expand. Let me have a lot of children and grandchildren. All of these very basic human aims. Let all my family survive. Let my livestock survive. You know the the the, the f uh, main uh, the demands, the needs, the desires of a, you know, of a ancient agrarian society. You can see them. 
These are the things they want. And after death, let me go to heaven and have a very pleasant life. All of that is one part of the Vedas called the Karma Kanda, the ritualistic portion. And the other part, the smaller part of the Vedas, the end of the Vedas is called the Upanishads. Upanishads is what is Vedanta. Upanishads are the highest spiritual teachings of the Vedas. Which is where you talk, we get to talk about pure consciousness and I'm not the body, not the mind, I'm this infinite reality. If you realize that, the talk about meditation, all of that comes in the Upanishads. Um, but he says here, all the Vedas ultimately they point to me as the knowable, the one knowable thing. Not just the Upanishads, even the ritualistic portions. Indirectly they are pointing towards me. When you are trying to fulfill yourself in this world or the next world, you will fail. To some extent it will work. You will try to fulfill your desires and having your desires fulfilled, you will find there are more desires and you are not happy. Then you will move on. What's more? What's beyond this? Then the Upanishads are there which tells you, you have to realize who you are and what all this is. Then it will take you beyond desire and it will take you to satisfaction, fulfillment. So, so, so the preliminary portion of the Vedas, the Karma Kanda, the portion dealing with rituals, and the, the final portion of the Vedas, Upanishads, the Jnana Kanda, the portion dealing with knowledge, spiritual knowledge, all of them, directly or indirectly, they point to me, Krishna says. And Vedyam, I am the thing to be known here. You see, yeah, that's um, about, that, that's in the Vedas. Well, no, not just the Vedas. All spiritual texts talk about this. And why just spiritual texts? What exactly are we trying to know or attain in this life? That transcendence, that fulfillment, that immortality, whatever we are trying to do, is this, is this God, is, is to be found with God. So not just in the Vedas, uh, but or in our spiritual literature, but in life itself, whatever we are seeking knowingly or unknowingly. Aurobindo says, life itself is yoga. For those who truly spiritually seek, they will find that life itself is yoga. Yoga means uh, spiritual seeking, spiritual practice. Those who knowingly are doing it, that I am a spiritual seeker, I want to find God. You are a spiritual seeker, you are a yogi. Those who do it unknowingly, that means, no, no, I am not a spiritual seeker, I don't believe in God, I am just doing my thing, I am trying to earn a living in, uh, um, and trying to get by in my life. Well, you are doing it unknowingly. So, Vedyam, there is one thing to be known, and that is I. Pavitram, and it's the holiest of holies. It's the mo most spiritual, most sacred. You know, this holiness, this is an entirely different thing, you know, apart from pleasure, aesthetic enjoyment, all of these are different. The holiness is true spirituality. Often in our day and age, highly secularized world, often when you say spiritual, um, people uh, make a mistake, they... Uh, you know, the either one end of the uh, spectrum is they think, like Einstein says, when I contemplate the universe, I have a spiritual feeling. Well, that's a poetic way of using the word spiritual. It's good, but it's a poetic way. When I contemplate a sunset uh, or the Central Park in winter, uh, I have this spiritual feeling. That's like poetic, an appreciation of nature. That's not the core of spirituality. It's holiness which is the core of spirituality. The best way to find holiness is to experience it for yourself in a holy person and ultimately in our own lives. The sense of the sacred, not just beautiful. Pavitram, he says, I, I am the holy. And then he says, the Vedas, Omkara, Riksama, Yajurevacha. So in the, in the Vedas, you find three kinds of, um, that is the the poetic the poetry part of it which are called rik mantras and from which has come the rig veda the word rig veda then there is the text part of it um, which is the yajur mantras and then these poetic poetic mantras are uh, they are, they have a kind of proto singing a vedic singing called samagana in in belurmat there is a school for young students where they teach it when so when they chant the vedas 
uh, you can see it's different from the usual chanting it's a singing it's a samagana it's so these are the three kinds of vedic texts the rik sama and yaju he says rik sama yaju are all of them and sri ramakrishna is to say all of the vedas they are merged into the gayatri mantra those who know the gayatri mantra is the most powerful of mantras om bhur bhuva swa and so on and so why did you say so on i don't know how many of you know sanyasis are not uh, allowed to repeat it uh, so uh, you repeat it when you are a brahmin student um or you are initiated into gayatri mantra and then at one of the key elements of becoming a monk is to give up the gayatri mantra because all of the gayatri mantra represents the entirety of uh, vedic knowledge other than the upanishads of course so the vedic knowledge merges into the gayatri the gayatri is so powerful the gayatri mantra is so powerful all of the vedas it's equivalent to chanting all the vedas the one gayatri mantra um you might say okay that sounds like a lark you are not supposed to chant the mantra it's good no it's replaced by something else in in uh, for monks there's another gayatri now then sri ramakrishna said the gayatri merges into omkara om so all the vedas this vast amount of material comes into one mantra the gayatri mantra and the gayatri mantra itself is condensed into one sound the om and the interpretation of the om we had this whole tremendous vedanta vedanta class the mandukya upanishad and karika huh? Om is the three sounds a u ma. If you take it together, it's not aum. By the way, little knowledge dangerous. I said, oh, I didn't know om was a u ma. Now I know. So the correct pronunciation is a u ma. Aum. <laughs> no. By the rules of Sanskrit grammar, a and u. When you put them together, they become om. They become o, and then ma. Um. So om. That's the correct pronunciation, actually. one of our swamis had this way with words you know it, it was quite funny um so for example to point out that here in this physical body is this is the spiritual you know your pure consciousness the atman in this body itself so you said look at the word the genome you see a om in between if you take out om it becomes gene <laughs> which i thought i thought was quite clever <laughs> So the body is produced from the genes. I mean, this all, all the information is coded in the genes, and then there's the om in between that. <laughs> anyway, so uh, om a u ma. So what's so great about a u ma? A represents our waking state. U the dream state. M mm, the ma at the end represents the deep sleep state. So here we are. What's our life? I am this person and here is my waking world the world of which I experience in my waking state all of it together just give it a name a uh. then i fall asleep we are tracking our conscious experience i fall asleep this world disappears for me i don't see it hear it smell it taste it touch it i don't see any of you this body disappears from my conscious experience in my conscious experience what's what happens other worlds come up which after waking i will realize they are virtual worlds created by the dreaming mind and in those worlds i am there too having experiences so that dreamer and the dream world give it a name u and then everything disappears into the blankness of deep sleep no world external world no dreams just nothing but everything is there in a in a potential form because everything comes out afterwards so that potential form the um you know the the seed form it's a little warm the problem with getting warm is people feel drowsy can you put on that fan it's right behind you yeah it's and if you want you can open the door out there so that a uh, little bit the temperature stabilizes a little bit and nothing against it being warm but it makes people drowsy <laughs> and the combination of vedanta and um, and uh, heat is is <laughs> devastating <laughs> it puts people into deep sleep states <laughs> so that that seed state is mm 
ma. Now this is the entirety of our experience. A u ma. Om. Now if you meditate on that, as long as the a uh is going, om, think of the waking state. U is going, think of the dream state. In your uh, practice, u um is going, think of the absolute blankness of deep sleep. What it's like. Now notice, you are the experiencing all three. They come and go in you the experiencer. This experiencer consciousness is called the fourth, so-called fourth, the Turiya. Where is it in Om? It's the silence after Om. Om. In that silence arises the A, U, Ma. And disappears back into it. Again it arises. But it says it's not a silence against the noise. It's underlying the noise. Uh -huh. This consciousness is there when you are awake. Because of it you have the waking experiences. Because of it you have the dream experiences. Because of it you have the deep sleep quote unquote experience. Not only that. It's not a limited consciousness. It is that in which... You, the waking, waking person, and the entire waking universe which you experience is coming in that. That's the stunning claim. If you just said, I am the consciousness and I experience myself as a waking person, as a dream person, and as deep sleep. That's not so controversial. I and mean, that's not so difficult to understand. It's sort of straightforward actually. It's just we are not used to thinking of ourselves that way. We could get used to thinking of ourselves that way. But Advaita goes much further. It says... You, the waker, and your entire waking world is appearing in consciousness. You, the dreamer, and your entire dream, all your dream worlds is appearing in consciousness. You, the deep sleeper, and your entire you know, seed world or potential world is appearing in consciousness. That consciousness you are. And these worlds are nothing apart from you. You are what you see. And why waking, dreaming, deep sleep? Waking, gross, physical. Dreaming, mental, subtle. Deep sleep, causal. In Sanskrit, sthula sukshma karana. All three appear and disappear in one consciousness. That is the meaning of Om. What is the real meaning of Om? The real meaning of Om is that A, O, Ma are appearances and disappearances in the reality which is silence. In the reality which is consciousness, the gross, subtle and causal words appear and disappear. What is that consciousness? Krishna says, I am that. So he says, Omkara. Now look at the verse. Pitaham masya jagata. Of this universe, entire universe, I am the cause, father. What kind of cause? Mata. Pita, Mata. I am the father and the mother. I am the intelligent cause and the material cause. Well, who made you? The Americans have a phrase, who died and made you God? <laughs> so who died and made you God? Oh God, who, who, who made you God? He says, Pitama. The one who made me, I am that also. So that means nobody made, made me. There's nothing before me. No cause. I have no cause. Dhata. The all of causality, I am the Lord of causality. All karma. I am that which is to be known in the Vedas, the Rik Sama Yajur, which is condensed into the Gayatri, which is condensed further into the Om. I am that which is to be known. So, and Pavitram, and the holiest of the holy. All right. One thing to be understood since you are the Dashta, you are the seer, you are the consciousness, and you are also what is seen. But what is seen is not always holy, mostly it is not. It's awful, it's unholy, it's messy, it's miserable, it's changing, it's, uh, it's, as he said, dukkha, suffering. In spite of appearing as this entirely changing and imperfect world, you, the one who is appearing, you are untouched. That's what he means by pavitram. I am all of this which does not seem to be pavitram, holy, but... Uh, I continue to be Pavitram, even if I appear as all this. Even if you appear as your most unholy world, you're still holy. You, the pure consciousness. Because you are untouched by it. Again, no, make no mistake. 
uh, you say that okay so if i'm untouched by it i can do all sorts of nasty things i'll be untouched no when you say i can do naughty things who's that i it's not pure conscious pure consciousness is is is, is a very good boy it doesn't do naughty things <laughs> to become a naughty uh, kid pure consciousness needs a mind full of past impressions and uh, senses and a body then it becomes a sentient being and that sentient being will have to pay for all all its actions there's no escape then next it's taking longer than i thought should we have questions then we have very little time left yes Yes. That's easy when somebody's behavior is lovable. Mm. Um but when the behavior is not what practices can we use to find that god in an unlovable person? Yes. So god can come wearing all sorts of masks. You can think of that. The person is a mask. In fact, I have often said this earlier. The word person means mask. You know, literally it means mask. persona these are the masks that greek um, theater actors used to wear and through which they would deliver their dialogues sona means sound so the, the person is a mask but what's the reality behind the mask according to vedanta uh, god is the reality so when we say nasty awful miserable behavior we begin to see you know that the the nastiness is in the body mind especially in the mind just as when we do the analysis upon ourselves i am not the body because it's a thing it's an object i'm not even the mind because it's a thing thoughts emotions memories tendencies personality thing you know vedanta says not that the person will ever become free you will become free of the person just as you are holy you are already free of your personality so to in that nasty person in the behavior of the nasty person is uh, divinity the reality of that but clothed with a not very divine uh, mask uh, playing the role of a villain <laughs> somebody asked me in the harvard divinity school i don't like your vedanta it makes mother teresa and hitler the same i said you know when uh, mother teresa was born as maybe a one month old baby and hitler was a one month old baby was the baby hitler and was the mother teresa a saint and there was the baby a monster maybe in some scars they were there surely they were there but at that time expressed no they were just babies again every day when mother teresa went into deep sleep and hitler went into deep sleep in deep sleep the thoughts activities no no thoughts no activities anyway so was one a monster and the one was a saint no so where is the saintliness and where is the monster in the mind in the heart in the samskaras in the person here the divinity is impersonal beyond that however this is in principle practically how does it how do we do it the practically the more you see that you are not a mind you are not a person you are the consciousness beyond the mind and the person the more you will be able to see others also as uh, impersonal that's the advaitic way the devotional way is to love your ishta devata your our god so much that that's very idea that these are also the children of god that god is present in the hearts of all beings because god says so in that case it doesn't matter so much how they behave it it matters that god is present there god lives in temples some temples are terrifying some are dirty some are spectacular some are old and decrepit some are new and um, you know spanking new and sparkling but the same deity dwells in all of them so in that sense Yeah. The more we see ourselves as bodies, the more others are bodies to us. The more we see ourselves as minds and persons, the more they are minds to us, persons to us. The more we see ourselves as spirit, as consciousness, as divine, the more they are spirit to us. Mm. Yes. Who asked? Who was? Yes. Yes. Like how do you 
Thakur says in my gospel, right? If you see Vyagra Narayana, don't go and embrace, but uh, from distance, not to pranam and move away. Yeah. So, so how do we uh, correlate? Okay. Good, that's an important point he pointed out. So in practical life, however, there's a difference. Yes, you will love and revere God in all forms. But Sri Ramakrishna gave some practical advice. One was, when you see everybody's Narayana, but the tiger Narayana, you don't have to go and embrace the tiger Narayana, because the problem is the tiger Narayana will embrace you also. <laughs> yeah. So you will have to bow down from a distance. That Lord, I know you are in this form, but behind the cage, and in the <laughs> you stay away from me. Because it's going to do what it's going to do. Why do we have to be practical? Because our goal is God realization. Until we have reached that goal. Once we have reached our goal, that goal, will it be different? It will be different. There are stories of... Uh, Swami Vivekananda was fond of telling the story of this monk in the forest in, in Himalayas who was dragged off by a man-eating tiger. And he kept on repeating, Soham, Soham, I am that, I am he. So if you, one reaches that state, one goes beyond evil. Even when you see evil, what is clearly wrong and suffering for us is not wrong and suffering from that person's perspective. Today itself we were reading um, Swami Shivananda, President of the Ramakrishna Orders. Early in the morning we were reading. So this disciple of his has written his reminiscences. So we, I had sent um, mangoes and lychee. So this gentleman used to live in Bihar. And he had sent mangoes and the lychee is... Lychee is lychee, right? You know lychee. Then the, Swami Shivananda, who was quite old and ill, he said, the lychee you sent, I had it made into juice and I had a little of it. The doctors were telling me not to uh, have it, but then you have sent with so much love and uh, you know, uh, respect, I had a little bit of it. And the mangoes have already been accepted by Sri Ramakrishna. You had sent 18 mangoes, they've already been accepted by Sri Ramakrishna, so be happy. But what does that mean? The gentleman writes, the mangoes were stolen in transit. <laughs> For him, it made no difference. The Sri Ramakrishna in the form of the thief came and took away the mangoes. And what Sri Ram he says is mangoes have already been accepted by Sri Ramakrishna. <laughs> <laughs> the smooth transition, you see. Just from that perspective, even the evil can be... But until then, Sri Ramakrishna's very practical advice, don't embrace the tiger Narayana. And then the story of the elephant and the mahut. Uh, the uh, student who learned from his guru, everything is Narayana, God. God pervades everything. He must have read this Gita thing, you know. And then he went out to beg for food in the village. And the elephant comes charging down and the mahut shouts. Mahut is the one who controls the elephant. He says, it's out of control. I can't control it. You might think that's a very unlikely occurrence in Manhattan. In Manhattan maybe, but in India even now that still happens, especially in Kerala and places like that, there are a lot of elephants. So the mouth shouts, run away, run away, I can't control the elephant. And this, uh, everybody ran away, but this student, Vedantic student, he thought, well everything is Narayana and the elephant too is Narayana, so I won't do any, it's God, won't do any harm to me. The elephant comes running down and I guess the elephant couldn't believe its beady little eyes when it saw the, <laughs> this guy standing in front of him. And he picked up the um, uh, student with its trunk and tossed him on the side and then kept on. So he lost consciousness, fell down there. Other students came searching for him. They picked him up, brought him back to the ashram. They revived him. And uh, uh, then the guru asked, what happened? Well, sir, you taught me that today that everything is God. You know, have to see God in the universe. Exactly what I said right now. You have to see God in the universe. I saw God in the elephant, but the <laughs> elephant tossed me aside. He told the whole story of the Mahout and the elephant. And then the Guru said, but the Mahout was Narayan also, but the Mahout was God, and God told you to run away. Why didn't you listen to the Mahout? <laughs> so always have loads of common sense when you come to spiritual life. Uh, take care of your health, uh, your peace of mind, because Spiritual life demands a lot from the from you as a, for spiritual practice. In a, for that, uh, the thief took away the mangoes, and that's Sri Ramakrishna accepting. And that's great. We know that such a state is possible, and hopefully we'll come to that soon. But practicality, uh, there's a demand of practicality. Yes, the gentleman there, you. Yes. Yes. For someone who is a non-dualist, uh, what are they praying to, or you know, what can they pray for? 
Yes. So non-dualist, what is a, now how can a non-dualist pray, pray to? What are they praying to? What are they praying for? Now, remember, in a non-dualist, how the non-dualist regard God? The wave and the ocean metaphor is very good here. You realize, in this body and mind, I am actually water. And as water, I am the one consciousness in all bodies and minds. In fact, I am the one consciousness behind the entire universe. The one water behind the entire ocean. However, having realized that, when you look around after the Vedanta class, the wave still finds itself as a wave. Right? Maybe a little smaller and coming closer to the shore where it's going to hit the shore and die. <laughs> So now knowing that I am the water and I am immortal as water but not as a wave and here is the water appearing as ocean and in reality it's water but it appears for all practical purposes as a vast ocean and lots of little waves like me. Now I can still pushing the Dvaitic idea to the background I can still act as a wave. I would be. I mean in day to day life. Even the enlightened person is walking, talking, eating, going around on his round of asking for alms from the uh, local uh, village and uh, studying Vedanta, meditating, taking a bath in the Ganga and giving lectures on Vedanta. If you can do all of that, why can't you pray to God? Yeah. You're doing all of that as a dualist. What would a, why is a non-dualist eating? Because of food and the body you're eating, they're the same thing. So it's like um, once you, the, a character in the movie realizes this is an appearance, the screen behind the movie is the reality, I am the screen. But afterwards the movie still goes on. Or a Broadway theater would be, would be a better example. It's a Broadway play. The actor knows, actor knows, yeah. I'm not Mufasa the lion or something like that, you know. And after knowing that, if he gives up his uh, lines and he says, hey, I'm not a lion, don't be crazy. That would be the end of the play. That would be awful. Uh, so after knowing that also, the actor does a really good job of playing the role of Bafasa or playing the role of the evil lion or whatever. Uh, knowing that I'm not a lion. Uh, so um, exactly like that, a non-dualist would do that. And, what, and so now I'm as this li little being I am pure consciousness in a non-dual reality, but as this little being, that same pure consciousness also is the cosmic, is God. And I have a relationship of devotion to God. It consists in pushing the uh, non-dual realization to the background. In fact, uh, today itself was reading, Vivekananda is saying, the beauty of non-dualism is having realized, realized the highest, that I am Brahman. You can forget it happily and jump into even the, from you can uh, the, you know the understand the dualist from the dualist perspective you can understand every kind of spiritual practice from the perspective of that practitioner they become all subsets the subsets is my language he doesn't use that language you can uh, and at the moment's notice you can go back to the um, the non dual background just like realizing that it's a movie doesn't switch up the movie realizing it's a broadway play you don't have to stop the broadway play let the broadway play go on and let everybody do what they are doing. But what would they pray for? They would pray for exactly what a dualist spiritual seeker would pray for. Remember prayers of two categories. One is a worldly kind of prayer. Krishna will come to that. Let things go well in the world for me. Let me go to heaven after death. That's it. Let my enemies pay for and suffer. Yeah. Let me be richer than everybody else. Let me win the lottery. So fulfillment of my worldly desires, that's one kind of prayer. That's worldly uh, prayer. That's religiosity, but not spirituality. Spiritual prayer would be, um, give me dispassion, give me love for God, give me detachment from the world, make my mind pure, may I, be, may I love God more and more. Jnana, bhakti, knowledge, devotion. This would be the prayer of a spiritual seeker. And as far as the world is concerned, my Lord, I am happy with whatever you give. Just give me the strength to bear it. If you make, so mostly the things are about asking God to make a change in the world to my advantage. I know, my karma is awful. Can you just sort of fix it in my advantage? You know? <laughs> that, that's what we are doing. Krishna will say in the next one, 
all of our karma is under the control of God and he's giving us the results of our past karma. That's small comfort for us because we don't want the results of our past karma. If they're bad karma, mostly it's bad. So we don't want the result of that. If it's good karma, we want the result of that. That's worldly prayer. The spiritual prayer is, let the um, results of my karma come, good or bad. I, I give up everything at your feet. I just, I just love you and my relationship with you is one of love and surrender and devotion. Just give me the strength to bear the ups and downs. And that's a wise prayer. Because the ups and downs will come inevitably, even if you ask God to fix things in your favor. It will only ha be fixed only for a short while. Things will again fall apart. That was the Buddha's deep insight. Worldly kind of, worldly or otherworldly kind of religiosity in the end does not pay. Because we are still left high and dry. Nothing works. So the non-dualist, in a dualistic mode, will still pray like a dualistic spiritual seeker. Give me devotion, give me knowledge, bless everybody, let things go well for everybody, let there be peace for all. No, what is called Vishesha Prarthana. Vishesha Prarthana means particular prayers for my own advantage. I can pray for the advantage of other people. Even there also, particular prayer is not good. It's good to pray for the welfare of other people. God knows what is, the, what is good for the world. So, do good to the world. If you see a pe particular person suffering, you can pray for them. Let their suffering go away. You can pray Sri Ramakrishna, Masharada, the direct disciples, Sri Ramakrishna. We see so many occasions how they would pray with tears in their eyes, but never for themselves. Never ever for themselves. For others, yes, all the time. No. Yes. And that will be the last one then. Yes. Yes. Samskaras, previous conditionings. Um, in the Sridhar Swami, in this, in this commentary on Bhagavad Gita, he uses the term Prajina Karma Samskara of the, the impressions of actions done in past lives. Pra, past means the in, word is Prajina, ancient lives. We are ancient creatures, very ancient creatures. And to some extent, we are all pretty nasty creatures. We have been animals or animal-like in many lifetimes to have come to this point. So we have a huge amount of baggage, only a tiny bit of which is manifest in this life. Uh, the poet, I think, it's Rajani Kanta or uh, Rabindranath Tagore, he sings that, uh, I am on this little raft, a little boat of life, my lord. And on this stormy sea. And there is unplumbed depths beneath. At any time, I may be swept away and then sink into the abysmal depths. Where there are the whirlwinds, the, the whirlpools of ancient karma. So, I, uh, please hold on to the helm of my boat in the middle of this storm, my lord. We, Advaita Vedanta often gives us a sense of a false sense of confidence. But we actually our surround life is surrounded on all sides by terrors and, um, and huge dangers. Uh, so this has come from past samskaras. Now one may ask a logical question. When did that come? From the earlier life. But when did that come? From the earlier life. But when did the first samskara start? How did they become separate for the individual? How are we all different? How did it how did you become individuated? says, that came from the earlier universe where we were there. <laughs> but when did it start first? There's no question like that. There's no first start. That's the answer Vedanta gives. Anadi, beginningless. If you ask, why did, in the Lion King, why did Simba, why was Simba like that? Yeah. Well, he got it from his father and his mother. Where did his father and mother get it from? From their past lives. And where did it start? Well, the real answer is it's a play for heaven's sake. <laughs> it didn't start anywhere. <laughs> That's the real answer. If you, if you cannot wake up to that answer, then you'll be given an answer like it's beginningless. And it's, uh, it, you might seem that, you know, people might say it's a cop-out. How can it be beginningless? It sounds illogical. No, it's not. It's perfectly logical. How? Because 
all these samskaras are finally rooted in ignorance in maya and not knowing our real nature not being able to wake up to the fact that it's a play that unable inability to wake up to the fact that we are one with god and this is a play and this is nothing but god all of it then it's all right but we are unable to see that this inability to see that is called ignorance so all right how does that help our case now ask a question when did ignorance begin what do you mean so professor j n mahanti a philosopher he explained it to us once many many years ago he said ignorance is always beginningless we are also just like you are looking we were students we are looking at him huh and try as, as if it's a very deep philosophical question matter he said no it's pretty simple how many of you know spanish i said no, we don't know oh you don't know spanish i said no you are ignorant of spanish yes So when did your ignorance of Spanish start? I said, well, when we are, when we are born. Oh, so you knew Spanish before you were born? No. <laughs> ignorance, agyana, is always beginningless, and it comes to an end when you get knowledge. When you take the first Spanish lesson, your ignorance of Spanish begins to recede and disappear. But it makes no sense to ask when did ignorance begin? If ignorance did not begin. then the samskaras born of actions done in ignorance also have no beginning that's the answer that's the answer so beginningless anadi maya so they say maya anadi sa anta not shanta sa anta sa anta means anta end sa anta with an end it is beginningless but it has an end when you become enlightened comes to an end all right you had a question the last question Uh, I never said we can never realize. The question is a good question. That if Atman is not knowable, not seeable, not thinkable, not conceivable, then what is the self-realization you're talking about? But notice that you are it, and therefore self-realization is what they call bodhe bodh, awareness of awareness, or uh, the realization of the Atman by Atman. There is no other way of putting it, but it's very distinct. It's very clear. In fact. Vivekananda says, "You must not go away with the thought that it is unknowable. Not unknowable in an agnostic sense. Not in a Kantian sense. The thing in itself is unknowable. Not in that sense." Vivekananda says, "It is more than known. In fact, he uses a word. He coins a new word. He says it is the knownest of all known things." I never heard the word known used in that. In all knowledge, it is revealed. A good example is the eyes. Example of the eyes. So, how do you know that these things, all the visible things, are forms here? This is I, with my eyes. I see it. The eyes reveal it to me. So, how do you know the flower is there? I see it. So, what's the proof of the flower being there? I see the flower. Therefore, it's there. What's the proof of Swami being there? I see the Swami. Therefore, the Swami is there. What's the proof that there's no elephant in the room? If there were an elephant in the room, I would have seen it. I do not see it. Therefore, there is no elephant in the room. So all the proof depends on the eyes, seeing or not seeing. But the eyes themselves are not seen. You can't see the eyes. You can see a reflection in a mirror or a picture in a selfie, but you can't see the eyes directly the way your eyes see everything. Now, if existence, the proof of existence is seeing something with the eyes. Suppose, in that case, what is the proof of the eyes? Seeing what do you say that there is a flower a flower vase? Well, seeing the flower vase. Seeing what do you say there is a uh, there is a swami? Seeing the swami. Seeing what do you say that you have eyes? Anything. anything. Seeing anything. Seeing the flower vase reveals not only that the flower vase is there. First turn before that it reveals to you that you have eyes. Not seeing the elephant in the room reveals to you that you have eyes. all seeing and all not seeing presence and absence of all things reveals to you that you have eyes so that is more than seeing yeah. what you see you could be mistaken about but whether you are right about it or mistaken about it you cannot be mistaken about the fact that you have eyes the moment you see something rightly or wrongly you have eyes that's sure similarly the fact that we have experience experience of what anything all experience 
It reveals to me unerringly that I am awareness. Next step, see that the awareness is limitless. That's what we are doing. That is Brahman. It's as simple as that and not quite simple also. Let me just add one thing here. Why did I say not simple? I heard this sadhu, a very rough kind. Rough means didn't seem to be a very highly Vedantic, you know, Sanskrit, new Sanskrit, but uh, rough in his ways. And he said something quite, sounds crude. He said, whatever you do, unless you weep for God, you will not become enlightened. He says, have you ever cried for God? Unless you do that, at least. Uh, and a lot of it. I was, uh, when he said that, I was reminded, Sri Ramakrishna's first spiritual practice was weeping. He cried for the mother. And that really struck home for me. Unless you can do that, nothing will work. He also said, wash away all your past karma with your tears. So when you're is weeping, we can try a little bit of artificial weeping maybe if, until the real thing comes. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu Another sadhu I know, Ramananda Saraswati, whose classes is to attend, a great non-dualist and one of the persons I think was a Jeevan Mukta whom I saw in my life. A monk comes up to him. They all, remember, they are all non-dualists. Advaitins. The monk, young monk, new monk, and asks, um, so what, give me some instruction. What practice? You know, he thought he'd give him some sophisticated Vedantic meditation or some text or something. And in Hindi he said, I'll translate, he said, these are the exact words. Kya or karoge? Din, din me do bar kar sako to do bar prabhu ke charan me ro leo. What else, what more can you do? If you can, twice a day, weep at the feet of the Lord. How interesting, a non-dualist is saying this. A heartfelt advice. To a person who is a monk and a scholar and everything. He says, you really want my advice? You must weep at the feet of the Lord. One monk I know, he said, uh, you know, all this I've got, whatever I've got in my spiritual life, my mantra diksha, becoming a monk and whatever I've done in spiritual life, I wept for God as a kid. I think once, as a child. It made no sense. But I think everything has come from there. Yeah. That's his belief. Yeah. 